Hey, what's up? How are you? I hope all is well with you. Today's topic is neuroplasticity. So let's start. The brain is flexible. The control of some specific bodily functions such as movement, vision and hearing is performed in specified areas of the cortex. And if these areas are damaged, the individual will likely lose the ability to perform the corresponding function. For example, if an infant suffering damage to facial recognition areas in the temporal lobe it's likely that he or she will never be able to recognize faces. On the other hand, the brain is not divided up in an entirely rugged way. The brain's neurons have a remarkable capacity to recognize and extend themselves to carry out particular functions in response to the needs of the organism and to repair damage. As a result, the brain constantly creates new neural communication routes and rewires existing ones. Neuroplasticity refers to the brain's ability to change its structure and function in response to experience or damage. Neuroplasticity enables us to learn and remember new things and adjust to new experiences. Our brains are the most plastic when we are young children, as it's during this time that we learn the most about our environment. On the other hand, neuroplasticity continues to observe to to continues to be observed even in adults. The principles of neuroplasticity help us understand how our brains develop to reflect our experiences. For example, accomplished musicians have a large auditory cortex compared with the general population and also require less neural activity to move their fingers over the keys than do novices. These observations reflect the changes in the brain that follow our experiences. Plasticity is also observed when there is damage to the brain or to parts of the body that are represented in the motor and sensory cortexes. When a tumor in the left hemisphere of the brain impairs language, the right hemisphere will begin to compensate to help the person recover the ability to speak. And if a person loses a finger, the area of the sensory cortex that previously received information from the missing finger will begin to receive input from adjacent fingers, causing the remaining digits to become more sensitive to touch. Although neurons cannot repair or regenerate themselves as skin or blood vessels can, new evidence suggests that the brain can engage in neurogenesis the forming of new neurons. These new neurons originate deep in the brain and may then migrate to other brain areas where they form new connections with other neurons. This leaves open the possibility that someday scientists might be able to rebuild damaged brains by creating drugs that help grow neurons. Now let's talk a little bit about psychology and everyday life. Why are some people left-handed? Okay, here we go. Across cultures and ethnic groups, about 90% of people are mainly right-handed, whereas only 10% are primarily left-handed. This fact is puzzling, in part because the number of left-handers is so low and in part because in other animals, including our closest primal relatives, do not show any type of handedness. The existence of right-handers and left-handers provides an interesting 
example of the relationship among evolution, biology, and social factors, and how the same phenomenon can be understood at different levels of analysis. At least some handedness is determined by genetics. Ultrasound scans show that 9 out of 10 fetuses set the thumb of right hand, suggesting that the difference is determined before birth and the mechanism transmission has been linked to a gene on the X chromosome. It has also been observed that left hand people are likely to have fewer children and this may be in part because the mothers of left handers are more prone to miscarriages and other prenatal problems. But culture also plays a role. In the past, left-handed children were forced to ride with their right hands in many countries, and this practice continues, particularly in collectivistic cultures such as India and Japan, where left-handedness is viewed negatively as compared with individualistic societies, such as the United States. For example, Indian has about half as many left-handers as the United States, there are both advantages and disadvantages to being left-handed. In a world where most people are right-handed, one problem for lefties is that the world is designed for right-handers. Automatic teller machines, classroom desks, scissors, microscopes, drill presses, and table saws are just some examples of everyday machinery that is designed with the most important controls on the right side. This may explain in part why left-handers suffer somewhat more accidents than do right-handers. Despite the potential difficulty living and working in a world designed for right-handers, there seem to be some advantages to be left-handed. Through our history, a number of prominent artists have been left-handed, including Leonardo da Vinci, Mike Angelo, and Pablo Picasso. Because the right hemisphere is superior in imaging and visual abilities, there may be some advantages to using the left hand for drawing or painting. Left-handed people are also better at envisioning three-dimensional objects which may explain why there is such a high number of left-handed architects, artists, and chess players in proportion to their numbers. However, there are also more left-handers among those with reading disabilities, allergies, and migraine headaches. Perhaps due to the fact that a small minority of left-handers owe their handedness to a birth trauma such as being born prematurely in sports in which handedness may matter such as tennis, boxing, fencing or judo left-handers may have an advantage they play many games against right-handers and learn how to best handle their styles right-handers however play very few games against left-handers which may make them more vulnerable. This explains why a disproportionately high number of left-handers are found in sports where direct and on one action predominates. In other sports such as golf, there are few left-handed players because the handedness of one player has no effect on the competition. The fact that left-handers excel in some sports suggests the possibility that they may have also had an evolutionary advantage because their ancestors may have been more successful in important skills such as hand-to-hand -hand combat. At this point, however, this idea remains only hypothesis and determinants of human handedness are yet to be fully understood. So this was our today's lesson from psychology and as you know we are discussing brain functions these days. 
so next time I'll be here with a new lesson if you like my work support me by subscribing my channel and liking my videos thank you for listening to me take care bye